Well, today is the annual parochial church meeting. And that sounds a fairly boring affair, but it's something that we have to do. And one of the reasons that we do the video that we've just shown is so that we can give a glimpse as to what has happened in this past year. And yes, Rachel, it is exhausting watching it, but so exciting too. We're a small church, but we try to pack a big punch in what we do. We love to do things with excellence um, because the world does things with excellence. And why should we do things in a rubbish way and expect to be listened to? We have an amazing message. And if we do the job of presenting that message in the best way we can and with the power of the Holy Spirit, then we've done all that we can. So we're going to be looking um, at uh, just a, a few things about our church, about the vision and values. Um, if you're watching, well, there's a number of people not here today, but if you're watching and you want a link to the video, just send a message in to admin at sdgn.org. And after this week, because we've got a bit of a holiday, next week we will uh, see to that for you. <coughs> Excuse me. So every year we have to have this annual meeting. And we're going to have it after the, um, the, the, the meeting here. It's a short meeting. It's open to anyone that would like to come, although there'll be a little bit of voting, and only, only if you're on the electoral roll can you vote. But you can hear, uh, really, as we look back at our finances and things like that, uh, how we've done. And, and there's some good news that we are sharing about that. It's also a time of looking forward. And Rachel and I came here 12 years ago. And a lot of change has happened in that time. And there's going to continue to be change happening. Uh, that's very unnerving for a pastor. Uh, it's hard to know how you build, how you do church. But unlike this place which is made of bricks and stones, the church is made of living stones. And we see that in 1 Peter 2 verse 5. It says that we are living stones being built together and connected. We're organic and dynamic as we build the church. And so just as bricks and stones are laid side by side, especially stones and connected together, so we're called to connect and join and grow together as God's house. But as living stones, we can't remain static, but we must remain faithful and stable. We're called to change. We're called to change. We're called to be changed. And we're called to be the change. And the reality is that COVID has impacted life, it's impacted church, life a lot. Churches everywhere are different. And despite the fact that we're now some two years further on from when we last reopened our building after lockdown, the spiritual geography, the spiritual landscape has changed here as it has in churches everywhere. A reordering of things in people's lives has happened. Priorities have been reordered, some for the better and some, well, not for the better. It's caused people to reevaluate how they use their time and resources, whether they go to church or not, how often they go to church, which church they go to, what they watch, what they listen to, what they do and what they're commitment levels are. The individual, churches and community have all been impacted. And although some semblance of normality is returning, the old normal is gone. That's a reality. We can see that all around us. But as a church, that doesn't mean that we've lost our vision and our calling. Last week I spoke on the statement from, that Joshua made in Joshua 24:15 that's been a personal focus for us as a family, for our marriage, for our family life. And it was this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I spoke about how it was the focus of our lives and how it directed what we did and why. And I said that we used to have a plaque on the wall by our front door. So that when we came out and when we went in, we were reminded of that ethos. And this week I've been thinking about 
wondering whether we should get an updated version to put up. And I would encourage us all to have a statement of intent like that in our house by the door. Because as you look at it, you can be impacted by it. It's no good having it up if you just ignore it. But as you look at it, be impacted. And the thing is, it, it nails our colors to the mast, doesn't it? So when you have people who don't know God coming into your house, or even people who do, they're going to look at it and they're going to say, hmm, what's that mean? And how are you putting that into action? Kind of brings a bit of an accountability, doesn't it? And similarly, in most churches, which are spiritual homes, they have something similar that they will hold on to, some kind of phrase. And we have it on our signage. We saw in the video that we had new signage on our property. And, and it's on the video screens when you come in. And in 2012, we set out a vision with a strap line, which we've worked with over the years. It's simple, it serves us well, it's, it is simple, but not everyone remembers it. But we try to make it, it's just six words, six words. I have no problem changing it, but we haven't come across anything better I've found yet to change it for. So at present, this is the one we're working for. Sorry, we need to get a new video projector because that's so washed out. Um, so at some point, splash out 800 quid for a new video. That one's nicer. But you can see on it, it says, love God, build community, transform lives. Let's say that together. Love God, build community, transform lives. Let's say it one more time. Love God, build community, transform lives. We need to be a church that doesn't just know and understand God's will, but a church that does it. And we find this first in loving God. The root, the purpose, and the way we will succeed in all we do will come from loving God. So the first point is love God. Love God is the, if we can have, yeah. If, to love God is the first and greatest commandment. And so is our foundation, is our focus. To love God means that we need to get to know God, not just academically, but relationally, experientially. It's a statement about worship, putting God first in everything. However, that needs practical outworking in loving others as Jesus taught us. So it's not just some nice idea, but it has real substance. And it's shown in 1 John 4.20 that reminds us that we cannot love God who we can see if we can't love our brother and... Sorry, we can't love God who we can't see if we can't love our brother and sister who we can see. And so the second part of that loving God is that commitment to love our neighbor who we can see as we love ourselves, which leads on to the second part of the mission statement, which is build community. So in loving each other, we need to get to know each other and build community together. Building takes time, it's work. We build an environment where we feel connected, we feel safe, but we're also outward looking and we bring people into that community together around us. Building community is not just a nice idea. It's not only about getting on with those that we like. It requires time, it requires work and effort to get to know others and to reach outside of the church to people. But building community is also based on the fact that God himself is community, is the Trinity, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so as we build community, so we begin to reflect who God is. He calls us to be in community with him and with each other. And we see this reflected in the early church in the book of Acts, for example, in Acts 2 and Acts 4, where it says they met together and they met each other's needs. Then the third part is transform lives. As well as building community, transformation is required. That's what makes a difference. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says that we need to be changed 
literally transform, metamorphosize like a caterpillar to a butterfly. So change from what we were to what God wants us to be. And so to the environments that we live in. We're not to be squeezed into the world's mold like everyone else around us. And so as we come and we think about those living stones put together, they're shaped. Bits are chipped off to fit together to make the building. So our lives need shaping, need chipping in order to make a building so that together we can become God's spiritual house where he lives. So we've got to change. God ain't going to change, but we've got to change in order to fit together and so that we can know God among us. All of us can know that. Sometimes that will be easy, fun, and sometimes that will be difficult and challenging. Transformation is a sign of God's life among us and it's the goal of our life. Changing to become like Jesus more and more day by day rather than changing to become like the world around us. And to be devoid of transformation is to show no productivity or fruit. Now, again, we're at that time of year, the seeds I've planted in my greenhouse are right now transforming into totally different things from what I've planted, into plants. And we and the lives of those around us, both inside and outside the church, should be experiencing transformation in some way as God moves among us. And so to help us with that overarching strap line, I want to break it down a bit more as a set of values because we, we need to have more practicality in that, in seeing transformation happen. There needs to be things that we can do, accountability. So the first thing is that we discover the heart of God. We discover the heart of God in reality, not just as an idea, but we do that in a journey and a process. The things we face, the things we experience, we discover God with us in that. And so that involves continually getting to know God more, growing in a daily walk with God, reading his word, praying, being filled daily with the presence and spirit of God in order that we can give out, in order we can grow in the fruit of the spirit, which are the characteristics of God, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering gentleness. We need to develop and cultivate a reliance on the Holy Spirit in worship and teaching just as the early church did and raise the expectation among us of encountering God in our times together and in everyday life. And that's why we have a monthly encounter evening. That's why it's so important. Ephesians 5.18 says this, be filled with the Spirit. And that's why the expectation here at St. George's is that anyone who wants to be in leadership or serve really in the church definitely needs to be coming to encounter because it's like the engine room of the church. It helps people understand and experience the kind of spiritual DNA that we are as a church. And the other good thing is that you know, people are finding it difficult to build relation together, relationship together. It kind of highlights that and highlights our need for more of God in our life. And then we come into the practical thing of discipleship because Jesus told us that we had to go and make disciples of all nations. A disciple is basically someone who's in the process of discovering the heart of God and putting it into action. Putting into action what God is teaching them and so showing that they are following him and love is the motivation of that Jesus said if you love me you'll do what I ask if you love me you'll do what I ask words can be cheap oh God I love you I love you I love you and then we do exactly what we want that's not love if you love me you'll do what I ask and so in this discipleship we find accountability we find interdependence in relationships, not independence, 
is very countercultural. So that means that we have issues on our lives, in our lives, touched and addressed in order to help us grow into maturity. But then also disciples pass it on. They don't just keep it to themselves. So anyone who's a follower of Jesus needs to be aware of learning and realizing change is never over, however old or young you are. And so that's why we have midweek home groups, connect groups. That's why they're so helpful in this. So in discipleship, we're growing, we're connected, we're accountable, and we're helping to build that community. And then, as well as touching on discipleship, the last couple of weeks, or last few weeks, I've, I've spoken about reaching new generations, that we need to be connecting with our younger people. And we need to be passing on to them our discipleship. We need to be passing on to them the values of Jesus, what we're seeing in the Word. Anyone can be a disciple, and anyone who's a follower of Jesus should be a disciple. In Acts 2, the first sermon on the day of Pentecost, the apostle preacher said that the Holy Spirit had been poured out and it was poured out on young and old. It was for all whom the Lord will call. So at St. George's, we're committed to being multi-generational. So we mustn't just see new people come to faith in evangelism, but we must see younger people come to faith too and see them disciple. That's why it's exciting to see on the video that the kids' work is growing and it's developing under Melody's leadership and we're so thankful for the team and it's impacting the depth of spiritual encounter and understanding with the children which is wonderful. Along with this as we saw again on the video it's encouraging to see how Tots and Dots under Rachel's leadership is impacting families from the wider community for good. And it's helping to build that greater sense of community. That in turn then helps us see communities transformed. Transformed communities. In, in Luke 4, Jesus said he came to make a tangible difference to society. The Spirit of the Lord was on him, anointed to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind, set the oppressed free. And we need to be a transformed community that transforms the community. Otherwise, we're just a social club. We're meeting our own needs. So that's why we do things like Alpha, Tots and Dots, Bonfire, Light Party, Christmas events, Living Nativity, Love Christmas, etc. They're connection points. They're not the only ones. And we want to look at discipleship this year, how we practically individually reach out, not just as a community, but individuals as part of that community. But these are connection points for people to experience in the transforming power of God in life and to give people around us that same opportunity for transformation. And then the final value I would want to look at, which I spoke about also in the last month, so as well as passing on to next generations is practicing generosity. That we practice generosity. And, and I said in my talk a month ago, practice is the key word here. You don't do it once. You get in a rhythm of practicing generosity. And generosity is an attitude, one that needs practicing and developing. So we're not begrudging in what we do and who we share with. And we learn and we practice to give the best we can, to give God the best, to do the best we can for God, to develop an excellence in what we do and how we love and serve others. So practicing generation, uh, generosity will show itself in, in love, in the way we honor each other and we speak well of each other, in time, in serving and helping others helping the church function, looking after the buildings and grounds. So together it's our responsibility, not just two or three people. In hospitality, which literally means stranger loving. You look at people, you think they're strange, you're called to love them. 
Yeah? That's all it is. Hospital is looking after those who are strange, those who aren't familiar to us. That's why it's so encouraging and a blessing that so many people when they come to St. George's say they got a fantastic welcome. They felt at home. But it doesn't stop there. Life continues after the service, so we learn to welcome each other, to open our homes, to open our lives, even when it's inconvenient. Generosity in prayer, being mindful not just to say, oh, I prayed for you, and you, you hadn't, you just said the words because you didn't want to look embarrassed. But actually, you do pray for people. Even if it's a one-line prayer, you can say, I'm praying for you. And praying for those who are not part of us too. Praying that people out there would have their needs met and we would be part of those meeting the needs. And, and generosity in finance. Recognizing, as we said, that everything we have is God's. And so it's not up to us how we spend it. We say, God, how, would, how do you think we should spend what we have? We get wisdom from him. And so that's why we give and we tithe. The first thing we do with what we have is not... Well, we have to pay tax because they take it off us at source and national insurance. But the first thing we do when we get it is we give to God and then we look at what else we're going to do. We give proportionally. We learn how to practice generosity. We invest back in his plans and we invest in blessing others too. <coughs> so we have an opportunity to enter into what God wants next for us as a church. It will be different from what we did last year. There may be different people involved. We will have different experiences. We will do something similar, but they will be different. The main thing is that we celebrate the victories, we remember the good things God's done, and we learn from the lessons of the past. But we leave the past behind because we're not living in the past. But we're looking to engage with the future. When God took Israel to the borders of the Jordan, very soon, this week, we may be stood at the Jordan. We may be crossing the Jordan, Rachel and I, as we go to Israel. It'll be a lot easier for us than it was for them. But theirs was a lot more exciting as God opened the waters of the Jordan for them. God had promised a land for them. But it wasn't just being given. And it wasn't just being given all at once. He said, I'm not going to give it to you at once, because if you do, you can't cope with it. You won't handle it well. It will actually be a pain to you. So I'm going to take you on a journey. You're going to go into the promised land and take it bit by bit and you're going to have to fight for it but when you fight for it it will be yours and when you get it root down and live in the goodness and the abundance of it and for us this year we have an opportunity to go into a new year i mean it's funny isn't it we've got different times of the year where we have new years but this is like a new year as it were in in, in the church calendar for us you have an opportunity to go into a new year and to receive what god is promising but you're going to have to fight for it you're going to have to claim it you're going to have to take it bit by bit it will be work but it will also be full of blessing too so you're ready for a journey are you ready for more i'm ready for more of god showing us what he wants to do in us and for us. So let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've done in this year, for your faithfulness. It's been incredible to see the lives touched, but we know there's so much more. Lord, our heart's desire is to see people come to know you, people set free, people healed, people delivered, people coming into a living, vibrant faith with you, people loving each other, people practicing generosity, people committing themselves to follow you with a whole heart. 
And so, Father, we pray, as we've talked about this year, that you would cause us to grow, that we would see growth in this place, numerically and in character and spiritually and in generosity and in love. We pray that you would be the center. We pray that you would be lifted high. We pray that you would bring people whose hearts of the same mind to us, that there would be joining and connection. We speak peace and blessing upon this church. We pray, Lord, that you would lead us and that our eyes would be on you. Thank you that you're a God of your word, a God of promises, a God who's faithful. And we say amen and let it be in Jesus' name.